So we were discussing in the previous week about sampling. And in particular, we spent a lot of time trying to understand the Nyquist sampling theorem. And I just wanted to review because some of it is important stuff for today's class. So we had a continuous time signal XT, review of sampling. So very quick review of what we did in the previous week. So we have XT, which is a continuous time signal. We have PT, which is a impulse train. K equals minus infinity to infinity. Oh, this is my XP of T, which is a sampled signal. And this is my ideal low pass filter. And I get XR of T. So X of T is my continuous time signal. And I multiply it with an impulse strain, I get a, a sampled signal, which is XP of T. And if I pass it through a low pass filter, I get XR of T, which is the recovered signal, XR of T. And uh, uh, one of the thing we studied in the previous class was the Nyquist sampling theorem, not previous, but the but on Wednesday. Which basically says is that if X is band limited, then XR of T equals to X of T if omega s, so the sampling frequency is two pi over capital T, if omega s is greater than two omega m. There are two ifs in this statement, so it doesn't sound right. Let me rewrite the statement. If xt is band limited and Omega S is two Omega M, then XR of T equals to X of T. So the recovered signal under the ideal low pass filter would be exactly equal to X of T. I wanted to mention that the cutoff frequency omega m should be less than omega c, should be less than omega s minus omega m. So a good choice of omega c is omega s over two, assuming that uh, omega s is the sampling rate, Nyquist sampling rate for this band limited signal. it satisfies this uh, condition. Okay, now 
you know the 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 reason why this particular result is extremely interesting and important is because one might like a casual observer in 1920 might say that uh, i don't have like i'm losing a lot of information in between these time steps because i i don't quite know what the value of xt is i only know it at discrete points in time i didn't don't know about the value in between these two time intervals so i'm actually i actually lost a lot of information due to sampling and nyquist came into the room and said that hey guys you don't have to worry about it as long as xt is band limited and your sampling rate is sufficiently high then the recovered signal using a low pass filter would be the same as the original signal so there is nothing to worry about we actually haven't lost any information due to sampling assuming that the sampling rate is high enough and that was the key key uh, discovery of 1920s in the decade in the 1920s and and it basically led to a whole bunch of research work done in this particular area okay so this was uh, the wednesday's class any questions so far on this particular topic okay and then in the friday's class we talked about aliasing which is your omega s is less than 2 omega m so when my omega s is less than 2 omega m then one cannot recover the signal xt exactly okay and that's because of what is known as aliasing and we were discussing this aliasing the the concept of aliasing in the context of x of t equals to cos of omega 0 t um and my omega s for various values of omega s we were trying to figure out what we what is the output xr of t going to look like so i'm going to fix some of the stuff so omega s is going to be fixed and we will look at different values of omega not omega s pair and the cutoff frequency for the low pass filter would be omega s over 2 i'm going to just fix it for the discussions today was there anything else i needed yes i needed the following facts the first thing i want to mention is my x of j omega and then the second one my xp of j omega is 1 over capital t summation this is the xp is the fourier transform for xp of t so let me expand this a little bit and this is 1 over t outside and then i'll have dot 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 plus
I have this is a, this is an infinite sum, so I wrote this terms around zero. So for k equals to minus one, k equals to one, k equals to zero, and then k equals to one. Let me maybe write it. This is k equals to minus one. This is k equals to one. And these terms are k equals to zero term. Okay, any questions so far? I hope everything is clear. All right. Now let's jump on to the discussion for today's class. This is all the stuff we have, we have I'm recalling from the previous week. Okay, so this is my X of J omega, pi delta omega minus omega naught, plus pi delta omega plus omega naught. Um, this is my XP of J omega. This is omega naught equals to omega S over six. So that's this particular figure. And in this case, my two omega naught will be equal to omega S over three, which is less than omega S. And therefore the Nyquist rate Nyquist uh, rate is satisfied. So the sampling is much higher frequency than two omega naught. So let's look at the other case where omega naught is two omega s over six. So then that is four omega s over six, which is again less than omega six omega s. So therefore the Nyquist rate is satisfied. So if you pass it through a low pass filter, you will get the original signal back without any problem. So this was the easy cases and we discussed it in the previous class. Now look at the more difficult cases. So here um, you, can, you can see the following thing. So the solid line actually shifted to the negative side and the dotted line shifted to the positive side of this omega axis. And uh, the reason for it will be very clear when I start writing the XP of J omega for this particular system. But you see this reversal, which is very important. Um, moreover, if you look at, so in part B, you had omega naught, this was also omega naught. Now here, look at this number. This is omega s minus omega naught um, on this side, and this would be minus omega s minus omega naught. Okay, that's what xp of j omega, uh, this is what it will look like. And in this case, two omega naught equals to eight omega s over six, which is greater than omega s. So the Nyquist rate is not satisfied. Okay, and it's the same thing here as well. In this case as well, when omega naught is five omega s over six, it's basically the same same story. So this is omega s minus omega naught. This would be minus omega s minus omega naught. And, uh, and you see that the solid line is on this side of the axis and the dashed line is on the other side of the axis. So just let's look at one particular result. I mean, one particular figure. So let's say this is my XP of, j omega 
or rather let's let's do it from the first principle. So we had written the XP of J omega in the previous uh, section. This was my XP of J omega. Let's let's write that again. One over T. Delta omega minus omega naught minus omega s. All of that stuff. So now I'm just going to carefully write down these expressions um, for the case when, let's, let's pick this case, omega naught equals to four omega s over six. Okay, so I want someone to do the calculation and tell me what I should write in the bracket. So I want to just focus on k equals to minus one, k equals to zero and k equals to plus one. And the cutoff frequency omega c for this case would be omega s over two. So just substitute omega naught here uh, in this entire expression as four omega s over six. And let's write down the expression. So I have pi delta omega, what should I write? Minus five thirds omega s. Uh, okay. Well, let's let's keep it ten over six. You are right, but let's keep it ten over six. Let's keep six as the denominator everywhere. It'll be easy to do the calculation later on. Then I have pi delta omega plus omega naught minus omega s. What would that be? two over six omega s. Am I right? Yes, I'm right. I don't know why it's taking me so much time to do this. Omega minus omega naught. So that is four omega s over six plus pi delta omega plus omega naught. So that is four omega s over six and then plus. Once again, I need omega minus omega naught plus omega s. So omega minus four omega s over six plus omega s. So that is two omega s over six, right? Omega plus omega naught plus omega s. So that is omega plus 10 over six omega s plus dot, dot, dot. Okay, I want you to write these expressions and think about what will happen when we pass it through a low pass filter with omega c, the cutoff frequency being omega s over two. So I'm going to pass it through a low pass filter, J omega with cutoff omega S over two. What do I get? Well, I mean, technically I should get XR
r of j omega what would that be equal to i'll pause here for about a minute for everyone to think and tell me what should xr of j omega look like so i'm going to cut off all the frequencies that are above omega s over 2 and i'll cut off all the frequencies that are below minus omega s over 2 Okay, let me give you a hint. So if you look at this signal, this signal is at frequency, this signal is at frequency 10 over six omega s. This signal has a frequency of two over six omega s and, and so on and so forth, right? So this one has a frequency of minus four omega, sorry, four omega s over six. This signal has a frequency of four omega s over six and so on and so forth. And what I'm saying is that the magnitude of all frequencies above omega s over two will be zero. The magnitude of all the frequencies below minus omega s over two would be zero. So that's the hint. Now, which of the signals, I mean, most of the signals will get killed and only two signals will remain. What will the ones yeah. with two over six stay? One over t pi delta. Which one? Uh, two six. Two six. Omega s. Right. And then the positive one as well. Right. Right. Two over six. Omega s. Perfect. I'm not sure if. Uh, the low pass filter has to have some magnitude. Let me check. Oh, so H of J omega has to be, has to have a magnitude of T. So this should have magnitude capital T. Okay, so where did I get this from? Let's go back to lecture 25th. And let's look at the, do I have the figure? Oh, I made a mistake in lecture 25th. So this should be capital T. This should be capital T. Uh, so make a change in the HILP J omega. This, this magnitude has to be capital T. It's not one as I had originally written. Okay, so coming back to lecture seven, uh, lecture 27, the magnitude of this low pass filter has to be capital T. So this one over T will get annihilated with this capital T magnitude. So all I'm left with is pi delta omega minus two over six omega s plus pi delta of omega plus two over six omega s. Now let's do the inverse Fourier transform. And what would my XR of T going to look like? Let me rewrite this uh, as two pi. Well, I'm writing it in red. 
2 pi 2 pi whole over 2. So that makes it xr of t equals to 1 over 2 e raised to So the inverse Fourier transform of two pi delta omega minus omega naught is e raised to j omega naught t. So I just applied that thing here. And this is what I get xr of t. What is this equal to? That's Euler's equation for cosine. Right, Cur yeah, that's right. So this is cosine two over six omega st. That's right, okay? And in terms of omega s and omega naught, this is written as omega naught t. So this is the case with Alaya saying, this is the case where my sampling frequency is lower than two omega naught. And what happened? What happened at the recovered signal? So the recovered signal is not cos omega naught t. The recovered signal is cos omega s minus omega naught t. So the sampling frequency, which was earlier absent from the expression of xr of t, because you, you could recover the xt exactly. Now that frequency is explicitly included in the uh, expression for XR of T. And this is known as aliasing. Any questions so far? Okay, so let's go back, let's backtrack what we have done so far. So we were considering this situation where omega naught is equal to four omega s over six, in which case the Nyquist sampling rate or theorem does not hold because the sampling frequency is lower than two omega naught. And my cutoff frequency is omega s over two. That is something I've fixed throughout this lecture. So in that case, I went through the expression of xp of j omega. I passed it through a low pass filter with the cutoff of omega s over two and with magnitude capital T. And so I get some expression for xr of j omega, did the inverse Fourier transform. And I found that, well, the recovered signal is not equal to cos omega naught t, as it, it would have been if our sampling frequency was higher, but because it's not higher, we see that there is some sort of, uh, I, I mean, there is a different value of XR of T where, where whose frequency is the sampling frequency minus the actual frequency of the original signal, which was omega naught. Okay, now this kind of idea is actually used in, uh, in, uh, as in, in astronomy, where if you want to measure the radiation coming from, I don't know, some pulsar or some neutron star and all that, and if you have a satellite which doesn't have the equipment to, free, to sample at that high of a frequency because of engineering challenges, then you just use the whatever sampling frequency you can use, omega s, and then the 
uh, assuming that the neutron star would be um, uh, rotating or sending signals, which is at a much, much higher frequency than omega s. So you use that information, you look at the uh, recovered signal, and then you can do the following omega r. So omega naught would be omega r. Let me call this omega r. So the recovered omega, no, omega s minus recovered omega. Right, so you can use it to determine the value of omega naught. Of course, in, in, in reality, things are a bit more complicated. So I gave you a, an assignment and you will see that there is a time dilation component as well. When you are doing such, uh, when you are recovering a signal with a much, much lower sampling rate. So the time dilation thing is considered in your assignment. So you will definitely get a chance to look at it and figure some of these things out for yourself by an actual example. So assignment eight. Okay. Now, just a side note. So if your X of T was cos omega naught T plus C, so you have a phase in addition to a frequency. Then after going through this recover, recovery, like after computing the recovery signal, you will realize that this is equal to cos of omega S minus omega naught T minus V. So this is the recovered signal. And this part where phase is multiplied by negative is known as phase reversal. This is of course when omega s is less than two omega naught. So when you have a phase in your original signal and you measure it through, uh, like you, you sample it at a much lower frequency and then you pass it through a low pass filter, what you will get is a phase reverse signal where the phase will have a negative sign in comparison to the original signal. Okay. In the next, uh, topic, we are going to talk about sampling of discrete time signals. And the ideas are exactly the same. So I'm just going to mimic the same set of steps. So we have a discrete time signal, X of N. I have a pulse train, which is summation delta N minus K capital N. K goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. And what I get is the sampled signal XP of N.
let's say my capital N is equal to three, then I have to pick every third signal. So I'll pick this, then I'll leave two signals, then I'll pick the next one, then I'll leave two signals and pick the next one, and then pick the next one. So this is what my XP of N going to look like. This is sampling and discrete time signal. Okay, mathematically we can write XP sub N as X, Xn if n equals to integer multiple of capital N and zero otherwise. So in the intermediate time step, my XP of N will be zero because I'm not going to sample the original signal at these time steps. Now let's look at the, uh, the, the frequency domain. So we, this is all in time domain. We understand what it means to sample in time domain. Now let's look at what, had, what it means in frequency domain, which is basically mirroring the same thing we did for continuous time signal. And what we will see is basically the same set of ideas that we applied for the continuous time signals are also applicable in the context of discrete time signal. So let's do that. So I have the Fourier transform. So this is my Xn whose Fourier transform is X e raised to J omega. And then I have PN, which is the impulse strain. So the Fourier transform will be P of e raised to J omega which is given by So I have XP of e raised to J omega. So remember it's multiplication in time domain. So it must be convolution in Fourier domain. However, this is a discrete time signal. So it's a periodic convolution in Fourier domain. I want to remind you this is periodic convolution. And the 
integral is given by one over two pi. You can integrate over any length two pi of x e raised to j omega p e raised to j omega, sorry, this should be theta omega minus theta d theta. Okay, now this looks very complicated because the domain of theta goes from any two pi interval, let's say minus pi to pi or zero to two pi. And then we have this convolution with, oh, this should be omega minus theta. Omega minus theta minus k omega s. Yeah, now it looks correct. So after doing all this con periodic convolution over a length of interval two pi, what you will get is one over n summation k equals zero to n minus one of x e raised to j omega minus k omega s. Okay. Any questions so far with this convolution or anything we have done for discrete time signals? Okay. Now, as in the previous case, we have xn, it gets multiplied by pn, we get xp of n. Let's just pass it through a low pass filter, which of course now it's a discrete time filter, not a continuous time filter, but it's still an ideal low pass filter. And I will get xr of n. And just like it was in the case of discrete time signal, oh, the cutoff frequency here, omega C must be less than omega S minus omega M. And it should be greater than omega M. And you, you have the usual result, the sampling sampling rate omega s greater than two omega m. So if xn is a band limited signal and the sampling frequency is higher than two omega m, then it implies that the reconstruction is perfect. Omega s is less than equal to two omega m. Okay, I, I don't want to talk about equal to. So if it is less than two omega m, then you cannot recover the original signal. 
when it's equal to two omega m, you can recover in some cases when the phase is zero and you can recover, you may not be able to recover if the phase is not zero or the phase doesn't satisfy some specific condition. So we'll not talk about that edge case where omega s is equal to two omega m. Okay, now the only other important note I want to make, so something that I missed in the previous, uh, in the continuous time case, so I just want to make sure I write it explicitly. So if you look at the absolute value of the ideal low pass filter, this is omega C, this is minus omega C, this is omega, and this value is capital N. this value is capital N. So the magnitude of the low pass filter must be capital N. And just like in the continuous time case, I can take omega C to be equal to omega S over two without any problem. It satisfies the condition that omega C should be greater than omega M and less than omega S minus omega M. Okay, exactly the same story. I'm not changing the story at all. So whatever we did for continuous time seems to hold also for the discrete time case. You have a band limited signal. If your sampling rate is sufficiently high, you can recover the original signal without any loss. Okay. Now let's look at an example. Let's say I have a signal e raised to j omega. This is minus pi, sorry, this is plus pi. This is minus pi. And remember that in, in discrete time, the Fourier transform of discrete time signals, they are periodic signals of period two pi. So after outside of the interval minus pi to pi, it's just going to repeat what's happening inside minus pi to pi interval. Let's say I have some x e raised to j omega that looks like this. And this is two pi over nine and minus two pi over nine. So I have some non-zero value in between this interval and then it's equal to zero. So this is the band limited signal. This is my omega m. What I want to find out the question that I want to find out is what should be the maximum? What's the maximum frequency at which I can sample? Not max frequency. Of course, I can sample every sec every time step max n that we can use to sample x sub n so that xr of n is equal to x of n. So I can recover the original signal back.
Okay, so how should we do this? Well, I know that omega s must be greater than what? Omega s must be greater than No one wants to, no one wants to attempt this part. Would that be two okay. omega m? Yeah, two omega m, right. I got a answer from chat as well. Yes, so this is two omega m, which is four pi over nine. Okay, so this is two pi over n should be greater than four pi over nine, which means n must be less than, what would that be? Nine over two? So the maximum value of n I can use is four. So I can sample every fourth signal and I can reconstruct the original signal back without any problem. Okay, so that's all I had for today. Um, our time is nearly up. So in the next class, we'll talk about analog to digital and digital to analog conversion using the idea or using the concept of sampling. And we'll see some examples of why would such a conversion be useful? And I'm going to reflect on some of my own research and how we use the sampled signal to do a lot of cool things in the context of autonomous vehicles and fuel economy. So thanks a lot and I'll talk to you on Wednesday. Have a good one. Thank you. I had a question about the last thing that we wrote. Um, why would we have a maximum N instead of a minimum? Like, wouldn't you want to sample it a lot to make sure you could reconstruct it? Uh, oh, why, like why an upper limit to yeah. sampling? So um, we want to sample as fewer number of times as possible, right? Without losing out any information about the signal. So if okay. you want to sample as fewest number of times as you want, then you want your end to be maximum. So let's go back to the signal, right? So I want to sample Ideally, I would be very happy if I could sample once and then I skip 10 time steps and then I sample another one and then skip 10 time steps and sample another one because then I'm not, I don't have to store as much information. But you oh, can't okay. really do that because you lose a lot of information because your sampling rate will be two pi over n. So the n is larger. So two pi over n will be much smaller. Okay. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Sure. I have a quick question about the example. Yes, sure. 